This is Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed, a series-based podcast focusing on surgical and medical education and featuring expert interviews and practice-changing discussion. Our host is Dr. Kara King, a member of the Cleveland Clinic's section of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. Dr. King is also the director of benign gynecologic surgery and associate program director of the Cleveland Clinic's MIGS Fellowship. This podcast is a collaboration between MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons. We'll be right back after this message. This podcast is made possible by Boston Scientific. To learn more about Boston Scientific, please visit bostonscientific.com. The opinions expressed in this podcast belong solely to the featured clinicians and do not necessarily reflect the views of Boston Scientific. And now, Dr. Kara King. I would like to introduce Ms. Nancy Peterson. I'm thrilled to have her on our episode today. Many people know her as the founder of Nancy's Nook, which is a very popular Facebook page dedicated to all things endometriosis. Lots of education and advocacy work um, has been done by Nancy. And so, again, I'm thrilled to have her on today. So, Nancy, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. We appreciate getting the word out however we can. Absolutely. So I just want to start out with your story, Nancy. Tell me your story. Where did you grow up? What kind of upbringing did you have? Well, I grew up on a little beat-up farm on uh, the Washington coast. Uh, Rained 85 inches a year, which is now why I live in Central Oregon, where it rains nine. I went to high school there, then went to Tacoma General. Uh, They had a school of nursing program in conjunction with the University of Puget Sound. So I took my sciences there and my nursing at Tacoma General. When I completed that three years of study, I moved to Portland because it had been kind of where I was born. I had some other family relatives there, and so it seemed like a nice place to start. I started at Good Samaritan in Portland. Very nice. And why nursing? What drew you into nursing itself? You know, I think my grandmother. She was the largest influence in my life. My family life was not real easy. I was in foster care for a while, and so she seemed to be the anchor in the stream kept me on the right path, right from wrong, find a direction. You know, you're a caring individual, think about nursing. So I became a nurse. (laughs) She was your true north. She really was. She was uh, the most profound influence in my life. Very special person. What did she do? So she was a rural teacher. In those days, the teachers moved from farm to farm. The winters were difficult. So they would live with a farmer's family and educate the kids within travel distance. She and her husband then had five boys and kept trying for a girl, which is why I think maybe I was really the most popular one of her grandkids because <laughs> I was the first girl. <laughs> yeah, you were babied, I'm sure, taken care of by exactly, those boys, right? Exactly. Yeah. So she had five boys, and they were all uh, farmers for years. The men, the men eventually in World War II all were deaf. They all had hearing problems, and so... They did not qualify to serve in the military, so they ended up working in the shipyards in Portland. Then she just worked the farm after that, after the boys left home. She worked the farm, had a a work crew, so she mostly put up vegetables and canned meats and stuff for that work crew. They did not have power, actually, in their home till about 1955, something like that. So she was doing all that on a wood stove in the heat of the summer. (laughs) Amazing lady. Amazing lady. She sounds. She sounds like she has a lot of grit and uh, has given that to you for sure. So when you first went into nursing, were you always in women's health or where did you start out when you became a nurse? When I left uh, Tacoma General, my first job was at Good Sam and they needed a nurse in the neuro department. And it was a referral center uh, with probably the only board certified neurosurgeon in the Northwest. And as such, we got referrals from five states. We had a 45-bed unit. They did not like intensive care, so all of those patients came to our department. And so it became a really profound learning experience for me. And we saw all kinds of things that you might not see even in just a neuro unit if you weren't being catching patients from multiple states. So I got started there. The hospital's director of nursing sort of liked my work and so she moved me rather quickly to an evening charge nurse and then the head nurse quit and so she moved me into head nurse 
and I was there about five years when they wanted a house supervisor. So I was there for a while. And then my back began to become a really serious problem. I had severe left leg pain, low back pain. I couldn't really find the reasons for it. So I was admitted to the hospital with an acute abdomen, and my primary care doctor called the gynecologist to his credit, diagnosed endometriosis almost instantly. So in those days, they used a drug called Enovid, and he prescribed triple-dose Enovid to cure. And we tried that for a while. It didn't work very well, except I was nauseated all the time. So getting a second opinion about that, the second gynecologist said, you know, this isn't going to go away. He said, we can maybe scrape some things, but I think you're going to be stuck with this as long as you have a uterus. So that was the next step that I took was, okay, let's take that thing out. So we took out uterus tubes and ovaries because the, the tubes or the ovaries were very cystic and I had had multiple cysts rupture even as a kid when my periods first started. So I did that for the cure and six weeks later the back and leg pain had not gotten any better and so they said okay you need back surgery, laminectomy infusion. So I said okay, had one of those too. Then I spent the next 22 years in just horrendous pain which got progressively worse and began sleeping only about two hours a night in 20-minute parcels. So that was pretty rough. I tried to continue to have a life. I moved from Portland to Central Oregon, bought a little place in the country, had some animals and, you know, big place for the dogs to run. And um, I had a roommate who was recently widowed, so she came along and we had ducks and pigs and chickens and all that kind of stuff. And I started nights in ICU and then evenings house supervisor. House supervisors in those days did everything. You get a call to help back up assessment of a baby in uh, the premature nursery or a code in the ER or trauma in the ER. Or when the OR crew is working on a really bad case and they didn't get to dinner, they call a supervisor and say, we need dinner for five people. I said, as long as you're not ordering specific things, I'll see what I can find. Dr. Redwine was doing a little small community health forum. Maybe he had a dozen people there talking about his early research in endometriosis, which was under peer review, I guess, at the time. It hadn't yet been published. And so I got to hear about half the lecture before being called to the ER to back up a trauma. And <clears throat> it was kind of going through my head, gee, this is kind of interesting. I wonder, you know, if I really went through all the right things here. Then I kind of just mulled on it for about a year. I was head of the hospital's research and development committee. We didn't really do clinical research as much as we did program research. What does our community need? And so we brought in things with the help of the hospital, of course, like the rehab center, which we didn't have, some maternal and child care things we brought in. We brought in the helicopter, which changed our whole organization. We bring in a helicopter people who didn't survive to get to the hospital. Now we're in your emergency room. I was talking to the committee about that. I said, you know, I, I, I sat through part of Dr. Redwine's research about a year ago, and I'd like you to hear the, the whole thing. So they said, okay, and we brought him in, and he did the whole presentation. And by then, it had undergone peer review and had been accepted for publication. So since the committee was intrigued, I then set him up with the hospital administration there were no joint venture practices with hospital and doctors in those days. It was all your business and my business, and they don't mix. But the hospital was intrigued and asked me about my interests, and I said, well, I had that once, and I, you know, I kind of think maybe his work would prevent some hysterectomies that don't work very well. So they agreed, and we set up a small education program and support program for patients who might choose to come to Ben. Now, Ben's out in the middle of nowhere. It's and, beautiful, but, but in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now it's the third fastest growing community in the country. Is it really? Just, just wow. posted that the yesterday. The word is out. Yeah. <laughs> so we got started doing some support group education things around the U.S. and Canada. In the meantime, I contacted a fellow who was the editor, a physician, uh, of a small magazine called Medical Self-Care. They only had a circulation of about 60,000, but I talked to him. He was really on to in things that were different and new. And I said, you know, this guy's work, I think, represents some change in how women might do with this disease. Well, he said, write it up. So he sent an editor and a 
photographer to Ben. He was in Northern California, somewhere outside of San Francisco. And we wrote an article together called Endometriosis Reconsidered. And about six weeks later, that hit the streets and precipitated a thousand phone calls the first week it was out. Wow. It got a lot of attention. <laughs> I said, hmm, we're on to something here. <laughs> Right? And yeah. so I went to the marketing department and I said, I need a budget. I need to be able to travel and teach women about things that don't work and this research to help them make better choices. So I began then about 22 weeks a year. I was on the road around the U.S. and Canada um, just lecturing on what we called modern concepts were the basis of his research which is now available online. Almost all of that published research has been encapsulated on something called www.endopedia.inc, but it's E-N-D-O-P-A-E-D-I-A. So anyway, that, as I began to lecture, the demands for lectures were growing, you know, more and more and more. We got some requests from overseas, but I didn't have a budget that big. <laughs> They weren't going to pay for you? Come on. That should have been included in their speaker fee. I got to make a lot of (laughs) wonderful trips to Canada, but that was it. (laughs) Not letting me go beyond the borders of North America. So one of the things that began to happen was people were really intrigued. I mean, the audience would just be absolutely stunningly quiet during the lecture. And the first few times that happened, I thought, oh, my God, you know, what's going on here? They don't like what I'm doing. And it turned out that basically when I asked what is going on here, the audience just sort of roared, she knows. This is somebody who knows what I'm living with. And so that link to patients became what has carried us on into Nancy's Nook and every place else. Every one of our administrators, and between the moderators and administrators, I think we have 15, have had the disease and have been through the process of 8 or 9 or 17 years trying to get to diagnosis. So I think that's part of our popularity with patients is we know, and we know what it's like to be dismissed as neurotic and to not be able to get the right care. But in the process of those lectures, what was happening was that after the crowd would kind of disperse, there would be a dozen or sometimes two dozen people kind of hanging around. And so I would just say, look, I just don't have anything to do. If you want to sit down and talk a little bit, we can do that. I, I'm going back to the hotel by myself and flying out in the morning, but I'm all packed, so no biggie. So we would sit there and talk. And they would have questions that I could answer or some I couldn't. And one of the trends that began to come out for me was the things they were telling me about their symptoms and the surgeries they had and all that. I kept saying to myself, that sounds like me. We'll be right back after this message. So in early 1989, I got back to Ben from a trip. I said to Dr. Redwine, look, I need to have my gallbladder out. It's causing a little cardiac arrhythmia. (laughs) It's scaring the devil lights out of me. It needs to come out. I said, while I'm under there and under anesthesia, would you swing by and take a look in my pelvis? He said, what, you had endometriosis? And I said, yeah, I guess I forgot to tell you that, but yes, I did. He said, no, we don't do it like that. You have to come into the office for a consult. <laughs> we don't just do a curb stuff consult <laughs> and do your surgery. Through. <laughs> right. <laughs> Darn, a guy was ethical. I couldn't get around it. So I went to the <laughs> office and had my exam, and he said, I hate to tell you, you've got nodular endometriosis on your uterus, sacral ligaments, and pelvic floor at least, and maybe the bowels involved. Because I was having back and leg pain, very severe bowel pain, pain with full bladder really li- almost life-altering. I-, I kept pushing through and used a variety of things. David Bressler, I believe his name was, was the director of the pain clinic at UCLA, and he had a book out called Free Yourself from Pain. And about 85% of their patients actually got better using those tools and techniques, so I was kind of hanging on to that to try to limp along. But anyway, David said, you've got endometriosis, and I think it's probably deeply involved, and so we need to spend some time in the OR. This isn't going to be just in and out. And um, it did take two and a half hours to remove my endometriosis 22 years post-hysterectomy, complete hysterectomy with ovaries gone as well, and maybe 45 minutes to do the gallbladder, so that was the least of my troubles. That was the easy part, yeah. Yeah. I woke in the recovery room pain-free. 
I was still pretty groggy, but I said to him, did you operate on my back or what? He said, what are you talking about? And I said, I don't have any leg pain. I don't have any sciatica. I don't have any back pain. And so, or low back pain, that was where the problem was. And so I was kind of stunned, but it was the thing that really said to me, we're on the right track. Uh, this is important work, and it's going to make life better for a lot of people. I mean, you know, maybe everybody isn't going to fit this mold, but a lot of people are going to be helped. So we continued, then I continued the lecture circuit till about 1995 when my hospital asked me if I'd take on a different project. Um, and the travel was starting to get to my upper back. I have some genetic malformations in my upper back that are quite severe. And so I could see that this isn't going to work out well. So I trained another gal who had actually been on the road with me some and had been taking care of patients when they came in charge of the program when I was on the road. So my back continued to get to the point where I couldn't work. And my doctor said, it's time for you to look for a retirement. And I said, God, I'm only 55. I'm really not wanting to quit at this point. And he said, you need to get off. You've got an 80-degree kyphosis with bones that are not bone. They're filled with a gelatinous substance. You're not going to continue to tolerate being on your feet. I said, oh, right. <laughs> okay, if you say so. <laughs> so. So I it's retired. Kind of a big deal. Much yeah. my <laughs> chagrin. And I'm 1997, I'm retired, and I'm sitting around wondering what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, because at that point, I could not be out of a recliner chair. I was flat down. I was in so much pain from my thoracic spine, and it had been ignored for a long time, in part because I started that program with red wine, and it created a lot of chaos with other medical staff members, because here, the hospital was singling out and favoring one physician, when in fact, it was really a model for which eventually became multiple kinds of joint ventures. But nobody could see that at that point. And I actually could not get care in my community. I had to travel to Portland, which was about 165 miles away. Wow. So anyway, I got retired, and I'm sitting around. I finally got a computer, so maybe I can do something there. And I started chatting, and AOL had some health rooms, what they called health rooms or groups, and they had one on endometriosis. And so I was chatting there a little bit, doing a little teaching similar to the lectures that I'd done on the road. And Heather Goudon, whose last name I didn't know at that time, but she's now the director at Center for Endometriosis Care in Atlanta with Cinerbo and, and Jeff Arrington, was one of the moderators for the group. And they used to try to keep the discussion civil and that kind of thing. And we chatted back and forth a little bit. And then she and Michelle Marvel started something called the Endometriosis Research Center, which was kind of a way to get information out to patients that was more clinical in nature, but help them understand their disease better. So they asked if I would be interested in joining them on their advisory board, but then helping them with a small chat group. So <clears throat> I said, okay, yeah, that's better than sitting here sucking my thumb, you know, I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> you had the knowledge, right? Yeah, you wanted to be helpful. Let's find yeah, a way to exactly. use it before I go to pot completely. <laughs> so... <laughs> So um, we started, and then it got kind of unwieldy for that group because it was growing kind of fast. So I looked it up the other night after you said you wanted to do this interview. I think about 2012, we moved it over to Facebook, and I think we maybe had two or 300 members at that time. As word began to spread, it began to grow pretty fast, and so we started adding administrators that could help us answer questions. And we used what information we what published information we could find online and we used Dr. Redmine's core research of modern concepts like what's it look like, where is it found, what happens when you remove it all. That general foundation of knowledge we use as our base for teaching. And then we brought in other things as physicians would publish things that seemed to fit, we would use those to add to our library. And it just sort of began to mushroom, you know, word of mouth, we're seeing more and more people. And there was a fair amount of backlash at first, like, who are these people, you know? Well, first of all, we've all had the disease, we've all been there, um, right. so we kind of know what it's like, and most of us have been experience. able to... Yeah, exactly. It began to grow pretty quickly, and then over the years there have been a few things where somebody published something about Nancy's Nook, and then there would be a surge. 
And so that has kind of continued to happen. And we went from those original two or 300 patients. So I think we'll probably hit 80,000 this week or next week. And wow. Yeah. That's just amazing. <laughs> you have just permeated the Facebook web, I you tell know, you. know, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> I, keep, I keep shaking my head, hitting myself. Are you sure this is right? And every time something goes out now uh, in the way of information, there's a big surge in patients. Uh, last year, the Washington Post has a newsletter, I think it's on women's health, called The Lily. And some gal who had been through, Lily Matthews, who had been through Nancy's Nook, gathered a research there and had had multiple treatment failures in multiple centers sort of just put everything together, taught herself what she needed to know, found a surgeon who was doing good excision, and basically changed her own life. But it took her like nine or ten years. The Washington Post picked that up and published it in their Lilly newsletter, which kind of surged, and then we started getting about 500 people a week in. And as that kind of continued to pass word of mouth, that grew to 600 a week. Then a month ago, Iris Orbach put her book out. And as that went out, we're now getting between 750 and 800 new people a week. And the message to the gynecology community is, you need to train more people who can do good excision because I'm telling you, this is exploding. People want, and of course, the other issue about that is, I, I'm not naive about that. I know that reimbursement's an issue. For physicians who are not working for organizations or clinics or hospitals or universities, they cannot cover their expenses with what insurance companies will reimburse them, and, and that's outrageous. And I know that there are some political issues around that with other organizations, and, and that does need to be resolved. This is a safe procedure. It restores lives. Physicians need to care. You know, if you're not caring, you're not doing it right. You're not, and yeah, you're exactly right. Patients should come first, right? That's why we're here. Yeah, and I said, I, I, I responded to that saying, you know, to a person, my 80,000 patients are telling me they've been flipped off, called neurotic, sarcastic responses, told they're not having enough sex, told they're having too much sex, uh, you know, told that they're just a, an emotional mess. And what I'm saying to you is that if a physician is listening and caring and able to hear what the patient's saying, the patient can't get through the interview without tears. They break down in tears because, oh my God, here's somebody that knows or at least is willing to listen to how badly this has infected, uh, affected my life. These kids are, when they're not all kids, but these young women and, and transgender men as well are you know, they're losing careers, they're losing partners, their families are bailing out on them because they're certain they're neurotic because their physician called them neurotic. Clear back when we started endometriosis, the endometriosis treatment program at St. Charles and Ben, I started a tick sheet. I had a little book on my desk and I interviewed every patient that came or the person that left me did. I wanted to know how did you find out about us? You know, what's your life been like? And to a person, 75% of them have been dismissed as neurotic told that the, you do not have diseases it's all in your head, get a shrink. With the exception of one woman who had pelvic varicosities, not a single patient who came to Bend had a negative surgery. They all had board-certified pathological diagnosis done by independent pathologists for endometriosis. Wow. And so 75% of them have been dismissed as neurotic. It says something about what we're doing. What are, what are we doing wrong? You know, I hear people say, well, you know, surgery is as good as medical therapy. Well, but you're comparing surgery by untrained surgeons. Surgeons who, I mean, I say untrained, untrained in endometriosis. <clears throat> Maybe they've taken a MEEKS program and they know how to work with the laparoscope. But it's been my contention that if you don't know where it looks like, you don't know how it evolves over time, and you don't know where it is statistically found, you're not going to get a very good outcome with your surgery. So don't compare it to medical therapy until you're sure you're doing all that. Uh, over and over, we have patients arrive in Nook saying, well, you know, I have all the classic symptoms, and my doctor says that he did a scope, and he says it. I have pristine uterus tubes and ovaries. Uterus tubes and ovaries 
are the least most affected tissue in the pelvis if you look at it statistically. I think the left ovary is seventh in order of frequency and the right ovary is ninth, but I could have that mixed. But those tissues aren't where the majority of disease lies, and yet it is a focus of so many physicians. It's a major concern. You know, patients come beaten down. You know, I, they looked. They didn't find a thing. How many holes do you have in your abdomen? Well, I have one. Well, Dr. Mohamed Mabrook, I think is the pronunciation of his name, recently moved from Italy back to Cambridge University in England. He wrote an article recently about the diagnostic laparoscopy and that the reason most of them are negative is that we are not looking in the right places. You know, we're not manipulating the uterus out of the way. We're not using multiple ports to look thoroughly or we'll tell a patient that they don't have endometriosis of the diaphragm, but we didn't do a good enough access to take a look way back there in the corner. So we have a lot that we need to do to help diagnosis be more accurate and patients to not be dismissed as neurotic simply because we couldn't see it on the initial look. That's one of my worries. I don't think we're doing a good enough job in preparing physicians for the whole profile. We see over and over, we see patients who come in and doctors say, endometriosis does not impact the bowel. You cannot be nauseated with this. You cannot have basovagal symptoms with endometriosis. It doesn't do that. You can't have whatever it is, you know, pain with sex is, is neurosis. You know, so those kinds of things, somehow we need to get into the system so the people caring for patients know that there is a potential that something like that's going on and that, yeah, it's kind of unusual, but it's not back to the days of Samson when we looked for black disease on the ovary. If you didn't have it, you don't have it. And there's still a thread of that, it seems like to me, in the voices of the patients that come to us, that, that that's what's been looked at. That's part one of this interview. Be sure to check out the next episode for part two. And that's all for this episode of Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed. Join us next episode for more expert insights and perspectives. From all of us at MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons, thanks for listening.